I'm Shiloh Sellers along with the usual crew, William Sule, Christian Unley, and of course the Sam Brown. The Sam Brown. Um, <laughs> the Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, guys. The one the only. <laughs> well, let's just get right to it. Um, we're coming off of a bye week. Um, I'm super excited for football to be back. I'm sure you guys are too. But yes. One small thing, they lost right before the bye week. They did. Unfortunately. Yeah, so yeah. let's go through the loss and kind of like tell me what y'all got out of it and what you think they should have been focusing on during the bye week. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, credit to Kansas State, really. Their game plan, they came out with, with the right mentality and the right game plan and just outplayed Oklahoma, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. And one thing I think that game exposed was simply how to beat Oklahoma's defense at this point. You know, we really haven't figured that out so far, but Kansas State did a really good job of getting those off-tackle runs, quick passes to the outside, and just getting positive yardage, chunk plays. I mean, you look at the plays, Kansas State ran 73 plays compared to Oklahoma's 53. That's kind of been the trend this season. The only, the only difference is the defense has been able to get stops to the point where Oklahoma's offense can put up the 41 points that they put up, and it doesn't matter. But here, when the, the defense is struggling, you really start to see the pressure built. And at this point, I'm not sure that Jalen Hurts and this offense are going to be able to bail out the defense like in years past with Kyler Murray and Baker Mayfield. Yeah, but I think it's a much improved defense, so it's a little bit easier yeah. on the offensive part to bail them out. But my biggest takeaway, you can always find a takeaway in a loss. You can find uh, bright spots to, to harp on. And I think it's OU stick to -itiveness. It seemed like when the chips were down, OU found a way to get it done and come back in the game because they knew they were the better team. But, I mean, you said at the time of possession, uh, mm -hmm. you said it through the plays, the time of possession was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But OU's stick to throughout it was so impressive to watch. There was three straight drives when the Sooners needed it most in the fourth quarter, ended in points, uh, two touchdowns, and a Gabe Burkage kick, who played phenomenally, yes, by the way. Gabe Burkage. Yeah, Best Oklahoma, kicker in America? Lou Gruzo Award? Lou Rover, Dicker the kicker. Yeah, they we scored. We got <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Big Burkage, I mean. They scored eight. 18 unanswered points. I mean, we said earlier in the season how we were unsure whether or not Jalen Hurts would be able to um, conjure up this offense in times when they needed it. Um, but I feel like he was able to do that. We saw him really lead the offense and score points when they needed it most. So I, I, I really like their their drive when, they, when the going got tough. Yeah, I mean, we I talked about in the preview to the Kansas State game, um, like this was going to be a game that Oklahoma was going to get hit in the mouth. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. were they going to be able to respond? That they did. They responded. I mean, they lost. And, but like, they, I mean, they got knocked down. They got punched in the mouth. And like, this this happens every year with Oklahoma. Uh, it, it's kind of becoming. It, it's unfortunately becoming a bit of a, like a Clemsoning thing. Like Oklahoma, like losing it to a team they're not supposed to. Um, but I, I agree with you. I think they're like the way they responded. Obviously, they didn't get the win. And like to Sam, to a point you made earlier. Like I talked about, like in the first show that we ever did. Like I didn't think Jalen Hurts was capable of carrying this team in the way that Kyler Murray and the way that Baker Mayfield have in the past if this defense doesn't step up. And I think we saw that against Kansas State. The worst part of the defense for me uh, was easily the linebacking crew. And one of the things that Alex Grinch has tried to let this team do on defense is play more instinctively, not have to worry about as much schematics and like things that they need to be doing. Rather, just kind of let them go to the ball. Like, yeah. do what you got to do. Like, be, be speed deep. And they just were not, like, with that, there comes drawbacks. Like without having those schemes, mm -hmm. if you're not, if your instincts aren't right, then like if K State, one of the things they were able to do so incredibly well was trick this like, Oklahoma defense, especially Kenneth Murray and those linebackers, into not like not filling the right gap assignments, not keying on the right people, and that led to what was 213 yards on the ground for K State. Like 4.7 yards per carry, and you you said it. Like they don't get to time of possession with 38 minutes unless they're effectively running the football. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of the perfect storm, to be honest. When you think about it after the game, I think we were all kind of sitting around and thinking about it. And Oklahoma won't play that bad of a game the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. and I also th I also feel like Kansas State won't play that good of a game the rest of the season. No. Yeah. Things just all kind of climaxed. You know, it's homecoming weekend. Kansas State looking to get a big win. And that's just the way things planned out. And yeah, Oklahoma did get punched in the mouth, but they're in the same spot that they were last year and the year before that. Mm -hmm. They just got to win out, let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, and we'll talk about college football playoff rankings obviously came out on Tuesday and like yeah. how the Sooners <laughs> fit into all that. Yeah. I'm just well. interested to see, look, we, I think Sooner Nation in general was excited about this defense mm -hmm. up to this point this year. Like they, they won the Texas game. Like they, they have played well all year and then that just, Evas ev evaporated? 
I wanted to say eviscerated and evaporated. Eva evaporated. Evaporate. 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 You know what I mean. Yeah. Evaporate. They, they, that, this was a Mike Stu. It was like I saw somebody tweet the uh, Alex Grinch dressed up as Mike Stoops for Halloween, yeah. which was <laughs> too soon. Uh, it was PTSD. Quality, hurt. It was quality, quality tweet. Yeah, that was a hurtful. That's a good tweet. <laughs> well, uh, like know, and retweet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like and subscribe. But it yeah. Was, but it, I hope to see this team go back to the defense that they had before. Yeah, you mentioned the linebackers out of position all the time, and it was something I, I noticed as well. They were missing their gap assignments left and right, and it was. You could see the, them gashing runs when Kenneth Murray was out of position, so that's what happens. Well, who better um, to sum up the K-State loss and the reaction than the Sooners themselves? So, you know, we all could have did something better to affect the outcome of that game. Like I said, I just think we're, we're trying to take the right approach of it, um, controlling what we can control, working hard every day, um, talking about having the right intent, um, and just learning from everything and moving forward. You know, the, the, the story uh, of, of our season has been getting off the field on third downs and a failure to get takeaways. Um, but, but, you know, if, if one thing's an advantage, uh, that quickly turns into a disadvantage if you're not getting off the field on third downs, we continue to fail to get takeaways. And again, it goes back to coaching, and uh, I, I failed. Adversity, you don't want to kind of branch apart. You want to bring each other closer so you can go through it together and uh, overcome it together, obviously. And then it just make the, the inning just much sweeter. So. Just, I feel like we've, we've done a great job of that, uh, battling adversity, kind of overcoming it. But like I said, this week this week on Saturday is going to be our opportunity to showcase how we've been practicing. Kind of like I said last week, every every loss at OU is shocking, it, you know, and, it, and, it, and it, it hits you different, it hits you hard. And uh, so this one was no different, but I, the opportunities after it are no different either. You know, it's a chance for us to you know, really rally and uh, as a team. We know the opportunities that are in front of us and we know what we can do if we play our style of ball and play to the level that we expect, regardless of what the expectations are on the outside. Back to playing of their level of play. That's, I think, the biggest thing that I got out of that. Um, I 100% agree with them needing to do that. You know, we've talked a lot about the defense. I felt like the offense, um, it had its same faults too, but what do y'all think about what um, the guys had to say? Yeah, I mean, what you said is spot on. That's all they can do at this point with four weeks left in the season. They've got to play their best ball, and they know that now, and I think this punch in the face, like we talked about, is kind of a wake-up call, and it's exactly what the team needed. You know, and, and I look at, you talked about the offense. I think that, yes, they ended up with 41 points, and I think that number kind of doesn't really represent much because of the 21 points that they scored in the last, what, eight, nine minutes of the game. I mean, you look at the third quarter. The third quarter says everything to me. The time of possession, Kansas State over 11 minutes, nearly 11 and a half, Oklahoma 335. That's the hole. That was the hole. The, the, the interception by Jalen Hurts and the uh, fumble on the kick, that did it. I mean, that, yeah, that did absolutely. Oklahoma in. Even, even when they had the comeback going, you knew that it was probably too little too late. Yeah, it's, it really is unfortunate to see. And I thought when OU was, what, they have a one-point lead going into halftime? Or mm -hmm. I think they were They're down, they might yeah. have been down one point, down. yeah, 24-23. I really thought that OU was going to come out and really show that they didn't belong uh, to be down one point. Right. And it looked like they did, deserved to be down by 20 mm -hmm. <laughs> in the yeah. third quarter. It was abysmal. But I really liked what Coach Grinch said. Coach Grinch really harped on the fact that they couldn't get off the field on third downs mm -hmm. in the third quarter. And they really couldn't. And that's what happened as a defense. If you can't get off the field, it, there's not really much you can do as an offense to uh, support your team. You're just kind of sitting from the sidelines and uh, kind of watching on as the defense just gets gashed play by play. And if you can't get off the field on third downs, there's not really much you can do. And I, I really respect the fact that Coach Grinch was able to to man up and understand and say that, you know, we made mistakes. We couldn't get off the field on third downs. We couldn't get takeaways, and that's a, a big reason why we lost. So, I I mean, as a, I feel like as a man, all you can really do is own up to your mistakes, and that's what he did. So, uh, m much respect to uh, Coach Grinch. Yeah, no, I, I was going to harp on that as well. Like, I, I definitely think it's, it's a big – uh, plus in his category coming out of that loss and saying that's my fault yeah like to be able to say like that's on me rather than like I feel like uh, we've already talked about him once not to name names pushed a lot of the blame on the players uh, and circumstances like you got to get your job done mm -hmm. you were the leader of that uh, that unit it, like if, if we're gonna harp on Lincoln Riley for the for the offense if they don't perform then the defense has to also be held accountable um, I think like the third down thing like it was interesting because Oklahoma, like up into this, like six, I believe, 
six of the eight games we played this year, we've gotten a three and out on the first drive. And then obviously a lot of those games led to led to wins. And then this, like we got a three and out on this first drive. And I was thinking, all right, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. This is the Oklahoma that we've come to know this season. And then slowly as the first half kept going, it got a little bit more off script, <laughs> yeah. I'd say. And like you harped on it, I mean that, or you talked about it. The this, the Jalen Hurts interception uh, like puts K State in an the incredible. Nick interception. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, I'm, yes. how could I uh, forgot? Nick Basquin interception. Really, it was a Charleston Rambo. We might as well call it Charleston yeah. Rambo yeah. interception I mean, at this point. If that doesn't happen, I genuinely believe Oklahoma wins. Yeah, this game. yeah we talked about it afterwards. Like, we yeah. all agreed. Like that was the that was the turning point. Like that in games like this, in trap games like this, it's a, it's about that moment of hope. It's about giving the other team that uh, the thought that they do belong in that yeah, game. Yeah. And that was that moment. And when you do things like that, when you muff that kick, you kind of, or you're putting your defense in a horrible position. Yeah. Because they're, I mean, we, they're, K-State only had 24 first downs with 38 time of possession. And what that tells me is that they had incredibly short fields to work with when they got mm -hmm. a lot of their opportunities. I mean, they, that Nick Basquin interception got them within like the instantly in the red zone. In the red zone the, yeah. I mean, they were right outside the red zone on the muff kick. Like when you have those things, like you, you're just putting your defense in a horrible position. Mm -hmm. um, so, like while I think a lot of people wanted to blame the defense for this, like you can't. It, it was not a one unit failure mm -hmm. it, as in previous years in Oklahoma. It, it was all across the board because the offense. I mean, they didn't score in the third quarter. Like that was a failure on them as well. Like, like you said, they scored 41 points, but. What does that mean if you're not supporting your defense and you're putting them in bad positions? Yeah, and you mentioned it, but the numbers say it all. Two turnovers for Oklahoma, zero for Kansas State. They played a clean game. Kansas State yeah, played a absolutely. really good game. Only 36 penalty, or 36 penalty yards, four penalties. That's, exactly. That's Chris Kleiman has always got his team to play back in North Dakota State. That's what he did. And, you know, that's, that's exactly what good coaches do. And Lincoln Riley was, was outcoached, to be honest, against Kansas State. Well, guys, that's all the time we have for now. But don't go anywhere. When we come back, we're talking CFP rankings. Tuesday. They did. Mm -hmm. I was shocked. I was with uh, some of our producers, and we were walking around saying, "What is happening?" Like, yeah. we had no idea what was going on. We were trying to predict the next one, and it, it did not go well. You've got Penn State at fourth, Alabama at third, LSU second. You've got Ohio State at number one. Wild, and not to mention, we've got quite a few Big 12 teams um, in there as well. We got Baylor well, at 12. Well, well. Um, OSU is ranked 23rd, yeah. and then um, KSU State. is, yeah, ranked 16th. So none of those are Texas, I would like to say. Yes. <laughs> I just want to point that out. I love that. But give me your takes on this tell me how you feel about especially where OU is yeah. OU is ranked ninth so BS oh uh, yeah I'll, I'll go ahead and get this out of the way because I think I kind of held this take in all week long uh -oh. I'm really excited yeah. for this to be able to talk about this it let's hear it talk about this yeah I'm not gonna lie I don't have much of a problem with this list as of right now at least the top <gasps> at least the top and hear me out this is the first of all, this is the first rankings of the season. Back in 2014, you remember the first rankings came out? Mississippi State was number one with Dak Prescott. Everyone was losing their minds, going bananas. I did forget yeah. about that. Back <laughs> yeah. Whenever I went to whenever I went to the college football playoff mock committee in September, uh, one thing that bracket. one thing that it one thing that I realized, thank you, thank you. <laughs> one thing that I realized is that they they could care less about who the teams are. In yeah. terms of names, they don't care that Clemson's the defending national champs. They don't. Mm -hmm. They don't care that Alabama's got Tua. They don't care what that that means. They focus solely on the numbers. And you look at Ohio State, 
first in the country in average scoring margin. They won their games by an average of 40 points per game. Yeah. They, 40 points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, statistically, they've got one of the best defenses in the country. First in scoring defense, they've allowed less than eight points per game so far this year. LSU's got better wins than Alabama does. I understand LSU being ranked higher. And then when you look at it, Penn State has better wins than Clemson does. And it's simple as that. Clemson hasn't played a ranked team. Penn State has two gritty wins at Iowa against Michigan. Michigan finally starting to look like the team that everyone expected them to be over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, I don't have much of an issue because it's just the first week of the season. Things will sort themselves out. I've I don't have much of a problem. Yeah, I mean, I agree. This top four, I think, is understandable. Um, people that the teams that are in the top four deserve to be in the top four. But once you get out of the top four and you move down, you see what you've got: Georgia at six, you've mm -hmm. got Utah at eight. I don't understand those two being ahead of Oregon or out Oklahoma, for that matter. I've what Georgia's got their loss to South Carolina. Um, Utah's got their loss to USC. Georgia's loss. South Carolina, who's four and five. Utah's loss, USC, who's what, five and four? Five and four. Like, I, I don't understand that. You, you look at Oklahoma and you look at Oregon. Oregon's losses to a good Auburn team, as we've seen as the years unfold. They, they've lost their games, but it, so be it. Um, Oklahoma's lost to Kansas State, who's at 16 in the, college, or in the uh, AP poll. Which looks I, really good for Oklahoma. Which, is, it, which looks good. I don't understand why Georgia and, or, uh, Georgia and Utah, excuse me, are ranked ahead of Oklahoma. That, that, that doesn't really make uh, much sense to me, but I do understand o uh, Ohio State at number one because they're, they've looked unreal. They're, unreal. they're dropping 48 points per game. They really haven't been tested too much. That's where my, um, my kind of hesitancy lies, mm -hmm. but they play Penn State and Michigan last two games of the season, so we'll really see what they're about no, as yeah. the season winds down. Yeah, I agree with you on a, on a lot of those points. I mean, the Georgia game was not, a, not only was their loss, to a team that is not as good as Kansas State. It was an ugly loss. They didn't look yeah. good. Not know. only, like, they lost to South Carolina's backup quarterback. Like, they, they South Carolina went, took the lead at halftime and then That's what I'm lost saying. their starting quarterback in the third quarter, and then Jake Fromm still couldn't move the ball. Like, <laughs> yeah. like they look terrible. And, like, that's, and I know you're Mr. CFP selection show over there, but, like, that, that to me is brand recognition. Like, if that, yeah. if that is, Baylor, who has is seven and one with a bad loss to South Carolina, that they are not a six. No, absolutely not. Like the fact that Georgia is that high is because people like are just loving on Jake Fromm and Georgia. <coughs> SEC bias. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I don't yeah. even need to cough. It's just an SEC bias. Like, and then I agree with you. The Utah thing. I was shocked yeah. to see them ahead of Oklahoma in this ranking. Most like because of that. Like one. They haven't looked as impressive in any of their wins as Oklahoma, Oklahoma has. And granted, Oklahoma's loss looked bad, but it was to a team that the committee clearly values highly in Kansas State. I mean, I think if you're an Oklahoma fan, you are encouraged by the fact that they're 16, uh, ranked ahead of an undefeated Minnesota over Iowa. I mean, like that it sh clearly shows that they respect Kansas State, who clearly show they're a good team. And so, like, I don't understand how I, – I don't think it'll last either. Like I, maybe it's just because they need to see Oklahoma bounce back uh, against. I think if yeah. a, a solid win today against a good Iowa State team puts Oklahoma ahead of Utah. But to your point, I mean Oregon's only loss was a close game to a close loss to Auburn week mm -hmm. one. I mean every year they Oregon talk, should have some more love on this list. I agree, and like and I talked about like in week one, like our show, like I was like I could see a Pac-12 team making it. Obviously, I picked Washington. Who, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not even going to get nice into picks, that. Nice picks, you Not even going to get into that. Like, the f my, my, my point. Did they beat Oregon State yesterday? I don't even know. Like, <laughs> did they even play? Who cares? Didn't bother. But, like, the fact, like, I genuinely believe if Oregon runs the table, they're in. Yeah. Because of that, the, their only loss is to a good Auburn team. And then the SEC bias working in their favor, that the, that loss. Like, I, and I'm baffled by, um, can, like, Notre Dame being, like, I'm, I'm baffled by Notre Minnesota Dame Minnesota at that 17, low. I think, is low. I agree. Yeah, it's and disrespectful. And like, since, like, they just had Kansas State leapfrog them. Yeah, that is. You true. haven't lost a game. I don't. Uh, I, yeah. I. Oh. Yeah, and I get the argument that like they haven't played anybody yet, but that'll change. I mean, like, today. okay, like, who, Kansas State. Neither has. Like, if you really think about it, neither has Baylor. Like, they they beat some solid teams, right. but nothing yeah. crazy that deserve yeah. that deserve them. They deserve to be number twelve. But the, what I'm saying is Minnesota deserves to be higher. If, I if agree. we're going about yeah. that logic. Yeah, right. yeah but I just, it, it's not the fault of the program. 
I guess you could say like years in advance is the fault for not scheduling tough games currently. Mm -hmm. But it's not you can't blame the program for beating the teams that are, that are placed in front of them. That's all oh, they yeah. can do. Yeah. And I like Minnesota, they're below some two <laughs> lost teams. Like and they haven't lost a game. I, mm -hmm. uh, they got a real test today. Hopefully, uh, actually yeah, I, I say hopefully. I don't. Yeah, I think Penn State's gonna come away with that one. For sure. That's gonna be a good game. Roll the boat, baby. Of points. Let's see. Roll the boat. Speaking of schedules, yes. um, what are y'all thinking about? the rest of OU schedule. They're playing Iowa State today. We've got uh, Baylor next week, then TCU, and then Bedlam, yeah. which is uh, one very chaotic and crazy way to end the season. <laughs> for us, for the definition of the word yeah. Bedlam. Yes. It's chaos. And it's perfect for that that is how we are ending the season, I yeah. think. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that by the end of the season, three of Oklahoma's four last four wins could come against potentially ranked teams if Iowa State can carry some momentum. Obviously, we'll talk about predictions later whether we think Oklahoma will win. Assuming Oklahoma wins today, Iowa State would be at four losses, which would be a tough blow to them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Matt Campbell and them can pick up some wins. Kansas State at 16 is a blessing in disguise for the Sooners. And Sooners, oh, like, yeah. fans know it. I, oh, Kansas State was unranked in the AP pool. They were 22 in the AP pool going into last weekend, going into the bye weekend, and picked up a solid win over, over Kansas, which, you know, doesn't say a ton. Yeah. And all of a sudden... Kansas history, well, not, not in history, it's like 2009, though. So I can't yeah. really. Yeah. Hey, I sold out. Mm. Sold out that stadium in Lawrence. I told you, Les Miles was going to change facts. the culture. It wouldn't happen overnight. Sell out game. You were well, talking that they were going to like I didn't challenge for the Big Twelve title, and I was like, once. "Let's calm down." I'll say, I'll hey, say this. The tape. I'll say this. We were in Lawrence. Roll the tape. They were close to. <laughs> they were close to selling out that Kansas stadium, but it wasn't because of the Kansas fans. Let me yeah, tell you that. Fair. We were there, and y'all yeah. know it. That's yeah. But no, I think I think that things are kind of shaping themselves up for Oklahoma. I think this will, even if they're at nine, this will be tougher than the years past to climb out of that hole because of the teams that are in front of them. Two Big Ten teams, three SEC teams, two Pac-12 teams, and Clemson. That's the, the biggest challenge for Oklahoma right now. But their work is cut out for them. Yeah, and I, it, this couldn't have shaped up to be a better end of the season for Oklahoma. It, it, you need to play tough teams once you get a loss this late in the season. And now that they have, they've got the opportunity to really uh, improve their resume against some 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 top 25 teams. Oh, yeah, and I agree. And I'm interested, it, putting having uh, the CFP putting Oklahoma State in, I think is really indicative of their respect for the Big 12, which is, again, good for Oklahoma. I mean, there, the, there are quite a few quality three-loss teams. Like, Oklahoma State is the only three-loss team to make the ranking. Uh, I mean, Texas, three-loss team that didn't make the ranking. I just kind of wanted to throw that out there, <laughs> contrary to my point about the Big 12, but, you know, it's not the set point. Arizona State, Texas a and Missouri, like there's quality three lost teams. And the fact that Oklahoma State, who really doesn't have a quality win up to this point, but like clearly the CFP committee like respects them, I think is good for Oklahoma going forward. Uh, but I, I just don't have a lot of confidence in Oklahoma's ability to climb just because there's, there's, a, there's so much chaos that's gonna happen. And I just I can't really see it happening. It's championship November. Who knows what could happen? Yeah. I mean, you never know. Like you said, Oklahoma's been in this position before. Yeah. And it's happened over and over and over again. But I think this Oregon team is really solid and easily the biggest threat to Oklahoma's college football playoff. Like mm -hmm. hopes. If, if Oregon runs the table, wins a Pac-12, which I think could easily be done. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, and you, you imagine winner of the Big Ten, obviously, if it's Ohio State, Penn State, or like one of those two is getting in. But like. There's a lot of a lot of barriers between Oklahoma and a playoff right Speaking now. Speaking of the Pac-12, if you look, Utah and Oregon, seven and eight. Those are the only two Pac-12 teams in the top 25. So. Yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for us here that's right fun. now. We're going to toss it back to Meredith and the in-studio team for the next big heroes and zeros. <laughs> Welcome inside the Gaylord Hall Studios. This is Game Day U and I'm Meredith Mulkey. Well, it's arguably the biggest year, biggest day of the year in college football. But before we get into today's action, let's look back at the best moments from last week across college football. Here's Parker Thune with your top five plays. League action, Dartmouth and Harvard. Big Green trailing by three. Time for one final play. Derek Kyler lost it up to the end zone and the Hail Mary is answered. Unbelievable, the Big Green walk it off, nine to six, the final over the Crimson. Ole Miss visiting Auburn. Tigers trying to punch it in from a yard out. Here's DJ Williams and he gets an assist from Prince Tega Winogo. 
Look at the offensive lineman body slam his running back across the goal line for the score. Tigers would go on to win 20 to 14. Next up, Oregon State visiting Arizona. The Wildcats would drop this game 56 to 38, but don't let that overshadow a nice catch and run here from Cedric Peterson, who reverses field, slips a couple tackles, and he's off to the races. Touchdown, Arizona. Northern Illinois visiting Central Michigan. Take a look at this catch from the Chippewas, Khalil Pimpleton. That ball off multiple deflections somehow stays off the ground. Pimpleton vaults over two Huskies defenders to reel it in. Witchcraft, an absolutely unbelievable play. Of course, after a catch like that, the Chippewas would go on to win. Here's the play that takes the honors though, TCU and Oklahoma State. Stop me if you've heard this one before. Chuba Hubbard untouched to the end zone. 92 yards for a pokes win and your top play of week 10. Be sure to stay up to date with Game Day U on social media and vote for your favorite play of this week. And we'll have a new top play next Saturday. All right, well, it's me and the boys here today in studio. Guys, how are we feeling? I'm Amazing. Good. Good. I'm looking forward to today. It's a great right. day of college football. All right, well, let's get started with your heroes and zeros. Zach, who's your hero for today? Uh, my hero, uh, we just saw him in that highlight right there. I'm gonna go with Chuba Hubbard, the Oklahoma State running back. Had quite the day against TCU, had 20 attempts, 233 yards, two touchdowns. And why is the hero? Is It's 17-17, third quarter, TCU's driving, get a scramble. They head into Oklahoma State territory. It's not looking too good. Oklahoma State is not having a great year, so a loss here would be pretty big for them. They end up fumbling. Oklahoma State takes over, and that's where Chuba comes, where we just saw that top play. He busts off a 92-yard run to the house. He has done this basically all year for Oklahoma State. He's been their whole offense, it feels like, with Spencer Sanders trying to find that footing. And not only did he have that 92-yard touchdown, but in the fourth quarter, still up one touchdown, he busts off this 62-yard touchdown, takes it to the house, and they're up 31-17, and basically Oklahoma State cruised from there. He then had another run just right here that set up a field goal at the end of the game to make it a 10-point game. So Chuba Hubbard basically put the whole team on his back, and and uh, just kind of kind of won the game for Oklahoma State and kept them in it. And then and then whenever they needed a big play, he busted through and, and delivered for him. Yeah, I think Chupa Hubbard's been doing that all year long. He's definitely a, a guy that should be considered a Heisman candidate. Yeah. And the guy that I'm going to pick for my hero is maybe not so much a Heisman candidate, but somebody that's definitely uh, one of the top names among quarterbacks, actually, when you look at it. But you may not know it because he goes to the University of Memphis. Brady White. He led Brady, Brady White led Memphis to a win over the undefeated SMU Mustangs this last week. He went 19 to 33 for 350 yards, three touchdowns, zero interceptions. Uh, ninth in passing touchdowns on the year, 10th in passing yards, sixth in passing efficiency. And let me tell you what, he was throwing a lot of good balls against that Mustang defense. And obviously the Mustang defense is not a top notch defense. It's not somebody that really is gonna rip you apart. But I'll tell you what, it was a good performance. John, uh, Brady White showed me that he is uh, deserving of being one of those top 10 quarterbacks. And uh, I mean, if you look at it, yeah, yeah, like, okay, so like I said, SMU's defense isn't the best, but they were number two in sacks coming into that game, actually. So, you know, the defensive line is good, uh, but the secondary is not really there. And so maybe that's why he goes for 350 yards, three touchdowns. Uh, but I will say he was probably under a, a certain amount of pressure. Uh, having a Memphis offensive line is maybe not having the best offensive line in the country, that's for sure. Uh, so I would say that Brady White definitely deserves to be a hero, so I made sure he was mine this week. <laughs> yeah, that was right. a big game. They had the home crowd, and he had to outduel Shane Buchel, so, and I mean, he proved it, so. Yeah. Matt, who's your hero? Well, as a Carolina fan, this guy had me pretty frustrated last week, but as a football fan, really hard not to appreciate the great performance from Bryce Perkins. The Virginia quarterback completed 30 of 39 passes for 378 yards and three touchdowns while rushing for 112 yards and two touchdowns. That adds up to 490 total yards of offense, the most ever in a single game by a UVA player. The Jalen Hurts-esque performance kept the Cavaliers atop the Coastal Division and in line for a matchup with Clemson in the ACC title game. Hats off to you, Bryce. I'm very glad I won't have to watch my team try to stop you anymore. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, let's move on to our zeros of the week. Zach, who do you have? I hate to do this, but pile on, beating a dead horse. I'm going to go with Willie Taggart, uh, the former Florida State head coach. 
Willie didn't have too great of a time in Tallahassee. He went 9-12 overall. They're 4-5 and five this year. They need two wins in their last three games, which the way they've playing, playing so far this year, not looking too great. The first year they fa failed to make a bowl game for the first time since 1981. Florida State's always a team that can at least get six wins, but uh, Willie did not have that much luck. I think he'll be fine in the long run. He'll get another job eventually. He's young, fairly young, and, and uh, has proven he can win with USF. But, I mean, even to pile on him even more, Oregon's having a great year. They're 8-1, and ranked seventh. He went 7-5 seven and five his only year there. They went 9-4 and four the next year. Now they're really blossoming. Couldn't even make the college football playoff. And uh, if they do, then Willie's just going to be kind of sitting at home uh, watching his former team that he left after one year uh, trying to win a national championship. I know a lot of the Florida State fans wanted to see him go, so seeing him get fired, there was probably a few elated people down there in Tallahassee. Yeah, it seems like you started hearing that they wanted him fired after like three games this year and, and just can't hold it off if you keep losing. All right, Dylan. Well, I'm going to take uh, Jafar Armstrong from Notre Dame, the running back who had to switch positions. He was a wide receiver as a freshman, and as a sophomore, he kind of did kind of both, full double duty. He was a wide receiver and a running back. But on this play, you're going to see him as a running back fumble the ball right there on the goal line. And look at Virginia Tech take that one all the way back to the house. Virginia Tech ended up losing this game by just one point to Notre Dame. And a lot of that, uh, that closeness of the game ended up being because of Jafar Armstrong's poor performance as a running back. It was 19 carries, 37 yards, and then that fumble on the game today, or, or in last week. Uh, 49 receiving yards, so he still did pretty well as, as his receiver core, you know, back there into the heart of hearts that he has. Uh, but only 1.9 yards per carry. And uh, coming into the game, Virginia Tech was 49th in the nation in rush defense, so when you look at the, the defense that he was playing, you should have expected him to at least have a pretty good game, uh, but he failed to do so, so he is my zero for this week. All right, Matt, do you have somebody that you're about to roast? Well, yes. All well, right. actually, not just one guy, <laughs> but seven. Florida's front seven. They came into the game against Georgia with 29 sacks on the year, but were shut out, unable to bring down Jake Fromm once. Now, they came close a couple times. They generated some good pressure, but were just unable to get Jake Fromm on the ground. Look here to Daryl Slayton. He's almost there. Finish your breakfast, man. As a result of this unit's inability to hamper Jake Fromm, he threw for 279 yards and two touchdowns. Florida lost the game 24 to 17, a loss that will likely keep them out of the SEC title game. I mean, yes, Georgia's offensive line is one of the better units in the country, but to me, if South Carolina was able to get three sacks, there's no excuse for the Gators to get shut out like that. And to pile on that defensive line, you weren't too big of a fan of Jake Fromm a few weeks ago, and seeing him <laughs> beat Florida probably wasn't too great. I also like the line, finish your breakfast. That was that P.J. <laughs> Tucker line, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that one. I use that one sometimes, cool. too. Yeah. Jay-Z, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, when we return to game day, you will discuss why the defending national champions can't get any respect, plus a battle of unlikely unbeatens in the land of 10,000 lakes. And is Joe Burrow a lock for the Heisman? Stay with us. Well, welcome back to Game Day U. I'm Meredith Mulkey, and we're about to go three and out here in Gaylord Hall Studios. I'm sitting alongside Matt Bowling, Dylan Rivera, Zach Verdia. Guys, are we ready for this? Yes, Definitely. I'm ready. All right, we have some hot, Always. hot topics right here. Okay, let's start off with the national defending champions, Clemson. They're sitting at number five in the rankings currently. Are people sleeping on them? Should they be in the top four? What do you guys think? Uh, I think people are sleeping on them so far. I'm starting to think that maybe I'm going crazy or something. They went 14-0 on the national championship last year, right? All right, so, and they're undefeated this year. Um, Clemson is rolling so far. They've had one game that was close, 21, a one-point win over North Carolina. Texas A&M was, I guess, a close game. It was 24-10, won by two touchdowns. Other than that, I mean, they've just been blowing out teams. They are the number three winning margin in the country, just to give you some numbers, 31 points a game. They're the number four win margin away from home, and they're the number six scoring defense. They just, it's, and they have Travis Etienne, who's on the screen right now. He has over 1,000 yards already and nine yards per carry, 11 touchdowns. This is a complete team that has, Defense along with offense, they have Trevor Lawrence at quarterback who hasn't thrown a pick in a couple weeks, looking like 
if he keeps playing teams like they, I mean, they don't have great teams on the schedule, so he's not going to be playing tough defenses. Build that conf confidence up going into the ACC championship game. Have kind of a tougher test if we see Bryce Perkins play like he did last week. And then if they win out, they're going to go to the college football playoff. And I think, uh, I think people are sleeping on Clemson a little bit. I think that they're going to come into the playoff feeling good with uh, an undefeated record and, and ready to show people why they should have been in the top four all season. Okay. Dylan, you think people are sleeping on Clemson? Well, one of the first things I want to say is, you know, the college football playoff rankings are a year-by-year -year basis. So, obviously, if, if they won the national title last year, that's one thing, but that doesn't mean that they deserve to be a college football playoff uh, yeah. team this year. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to say that they are, you know, should be way out of the race or should be way out of the rankings, but I am saying that they do not belong in the playoffs right now. They are uh, rightfully slept on, I guess we'll say. Um, and th that's because they're 62nd among 130 teams in strength of schedule. Uh, they're 33rd in pass offense, 21st in rush defense. Uh, in comparison to some of those other teams in the playoff, that's okay, but I mean, it's not up there like, you know, as, as we've talked about with Alabama and LSU, you know, those two teams are, are dominant teams. And so if you put them up, up against Alabama or LSU this year, I think they would really struggle with those teams. Um, and obviously, like you talked about, the, the kind of slow grinded out win against AM, 24 10, and then narrowly escaped the loss at UNC. That's what most of my highlights here are. You can kind of see uh, how close really that came to being a loss. And they haven't played any team with less than three losses yet, going back to that schedule point. Obviously, one of them, uh, one of those losses will come against Clemson. So, you know, really, you could say two lost teams, but then the game against Clemson makes it three. Uh, and then as, as the season goes on, we may look at it uh, at the end of the season and say that the toughest team that they played this year was Wake Forest. And, and that's something that uh, when you're looking at schedules as a college football playoff uh, voter or if you're looking at, you know, maybe just as a fan, you're going to look at it and you're going to say, well, Wake Forest isn't a, a team that like, uh, you know, an Alabama or an LSU has to face uh, as their toughest opponent. So I would say that uh, it's definitely uh, something that we should be doing is, is sleeping on Clemson. You're absolutely right, Dylan. I, I don't think people are sleeping on Clemson. I just think the Tigers simply aren't as good as they were last year. I mean, going through the ACC, they've been beating up on a bunch of basketball schools and doing so far less convincingly than last year. Case in point, the Carolina game. There's no way the Tar Heels should have been in this ball game. They had five starters out on defense Yet they still held Clemson to a season low 21 points and 331 yards of offense. Now, a large part of that had to do with coaching. Carolina defensive coordinator Jay Bateman called a great game. But still, I mean, you're playing a team that's probably going to be lucky to make a bowl and you almost lose. I, look, they did have some close calls last year, but... Those were against a 9-win Texas A&M team and a 10-win Syracuse team. Carolina Syracuse. is not nearly on the level this year as those two teams were Yeah, I always year. hear that argument that they haven't been playing, that, that, that they haven't been blowing out these teams by a lot. They beat North Carolina by one, that's it. But they beat, I mean, these aren't great teams, but they beat Georgia Tech by 38, Cuse by 35, Florida State by 31, Louisville by 35, Boston College by 52, Charlotte by 42, and a pretty bad Wofford team by 45. Like, they are blowing out teams that aren't good for a reason because they are a good football team, and none of these games are close. They played a close game all season. Well, and, and like I said earlier, I don't think that Clemson should be out of the playoff race by any means, but I think with that fifth place, that's about right. I would say fifth yeah. or fourth, somewhere in there. Maybe you could put them ahead of Penn State and yeah. knock Penn State back a spot. But again, it, it goes back to, uh, you know, the, the strength of schedule isn't that good. Um, and a team, I'm thinking, like in my head, I'm thinking about Minnesota. Minnesota hasn't played anybody really significant to this point, and that's why they're undefeated right now. Uh, and Minnesota's at 13. Obviously, Clemson came in higher ranked in the season, so that's maybe why they're a little bit higher. But and, and when I you compare it, better it's, team. it's, it's yeah. kind of apples to apples On almost paper. rather than apples to oranges. You know, they've got both, you know, a bad schedule, and that's why they're undefeated right now. Uh, and so I would say that, you know, Clemson shouldn't be in that playoff race right at this moment. And consider this. You know, you were, you were talking about, yes, they're blowing these teams out, but this time last year, Clemson had scored over 60 points twice. They have yet to do so this season. If we can't talk about last year for Clemson going 14-0 and winning the <laughs> national championship, then we can't talk about how many points they scored last That's year. A fair point. It's a new year, and they're blowing teams out. They are, but they, 
you know, like I said, just to me, it's just not as impressive, not as convincing as last year. You know, again, yeah, I think they're going to make the playoff. They should make the playoff if they finish undefeated. But I think it's more, I think their trip to the playoff is more likely to end the way it did two years ago than the way it did last year. All right, well, let's talk two teams that Dylan just mentioned, Penn State and Minnesota. Both undefeated, Penn State sitting at number four, Minnesota at 17. Are these actual playoff contenders? What do you guys think? Yeah, I think I might be alone on this one. I'm not sure yet, but uh, I'm going to go with yes. I think that, that uh, they, either of these teams has a chance to make the college football playoff. Obviously, Penn, the committee thinks Penn State is a good enough team, a strong enough team to make the playoff. They're ranked four right now, and they have Indiana. They have a really tough game against Ohio State and then Rutgers, but they have a fairly easier path than Minnesota does. Minnesota's got to get through Penn State today, still play Iowa, Northwestern, and Wisconsin, not even to mention if they make the Big Ten championship game. But I think that they've shown that this is, like a, this is a different Minnesota team. P.J. Fleck came, has come in, and it's starting to turn around. They're undefeated right now, and uh, Tanner Morgan's playing pretty well, especially in Big Ten play. He only has two interceptions. He only has four on interceptions on the season, but only has two in Big Ten play so far and 12 touchdowns. They have a great run game with Rodney Smith. They have a belldozer type in Seth Green. And, uh, and then I think Penn State has, Sean Clifford's been playing a lot better. I know last time I was on the show, I, he felt like he was more dink and dump, not really playing too well. But I mean, last game he showed that he can throw it a little bit. He's got 20 touchdowns on the season, only three picks, so he's an efficient quarterback. And I think that if either of these teams can get past Ohio State, then they can definitely grind it out and get to the college football playoff. All right. Dylan, what do you think? Well, I'm saying no from, you know, from a standpoint of both teams. I do think I should, you know, maybe have put an asterisk next to my no and said, well, if Penn State wins, I think they might be a contender. But overall, I'm saying no. I don't think either one of them is going to be a real contender this year. Uh, I mean, you, you look at the numbers. Minnesota is top 10 in pass yards allowed and passing efficiency defense. They do a great job of, of guarding the pass. They do a great job of making it tough on quarterbacks in your passing game. But that's not going to be enough to, to really put you in that college football playoff conversation. I don't think that's going to be enough to really beat uh, a team like Penn State or a beat a team like Ohio State in any way, shape, or form. Uh, and then, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, that, that schedule. Uh, you know, we look at how, who they played up to this point. The only wins against five, above 500 teams are South Dakota State, Georgia Southern, and Illinois. Illinois only one game above 500. So it's, you're looking at those numbers, you're looking at those stats, you're thinking, well, why is Minnesota even that high, if you ask me? I don't think they should be. And then Penn State has narrowly beaten Pitt, as you've seen in these highlights. Uh, Penn State has uh, narrowly beaten Iowa, narrowly beaten Michigan. Uh, and then I looked at uh, the total offense. I'm, I'm looking at all the total offenses, right? Penn State, you have to scroll all the way down the list to 52nd. That's where their total offense ranks. And in comparison to the other teams in the college football playoff, I want to make sure I get this right. Ohio State is 6th, LSU is 4th, and Alabama is ninth. So those are three top 10 offenses, Penn State 52nd. So when you're looking at it from those kinds of standpoints, you're saying, well, Penn State, Minnesota, you guys aren't contenders. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh and to me, it, it kind of reminds me of last year. There was a similar question raised about LSU when they got off to a great start. And could they, you know, are they a legit contender? I said no because I didn't see them getting past Alabama, the top dog in the SEC. Here, I'm saying no, again, because I don't see either of these teams getting past the top dog in their conference, Ohio State. The Buckeyes are simply too good. I mean, Justin Fields... Yeah, we know. He's been putting up numbers. Fourth in the nation in passing efficiency. 24 touchdowns. Just one interception. He's spent this season turning opposing defenses into Swiss cheese and Georgia fans into jealous exes. But I think, you know, we focus on that. We also overlook how good Ohio State is on defense. And part of the reason, I feel like, was because everyone, myself included, was so busy going gaga over the historic start by the Wisconsin defense that we don't realize Ohio State is pretty, not, they're not that far behind them in defense. I mean, they rank second in the nation in total defense, only behind Wisconsin. They've allowed a total of six touchdowns this season. They're, uh, they're allowing 3.6 yards per play. That's the best total in the nation. Uh, the reason that I think the Buckeyes were number one, I think that, uh, you know, it caused a lot of controversy, but I think... This, to me, looks like 
possibly the most complete team in the nation. And I think that's one of the reasons why they were number one in the initial CFP rankings. Yeah, it's definitely definitely tough to pick against that Ohio State team. I was hoping for maybe, uh, maybe an upset in that Big Ten championship game. Well, I think that's it kind of depends on your definition of a contender as well. Yeah. I mean, if we're talking college football playoffs, that's one thing. If we're talking about Big Ten, that's another thing. Because, yeah. you know, obviously they'll one of those teams I think will really – uh, give Ohio State at least a run for its money, um, you know, but uh, make them work hard. But at the end of the day, you're right. I think Ohio State comes away with that conference. But, you know, Penn State still has the opportunity to be somebody who could come into the college football playoff picture and maybe mess some things up, shake it up a little bit. All right, let's talk Heisman. It's coming up very close. Let's look at the top contenders currently. We have Joe Burrow, LSU, Jalen Hurts of OU, and Chase Young. Let's say, um, is Joe Burrow, you know, the top contender right now for you guys, or do you think it's going to be Jalen? Is it Chase Young? Is it somebody else that is not currently in the top three? Who do you guys have? Well, I'm going to have to go outside the top three. I'm going to take the field. Uh, there's, it's, there's only four games left, so it's not super early or anything, but I just feel like there's a lot that can happen in the last few weeks. We've seen it uh, back with Kyler and Baker kind of making late season pushes, but pick Jalen, uh, pick Justin Fields earlier in the season. Uh, he has the, no the touchdown numbers, 33 touchdowns, only one interception, and he's got a couple big games, Penn State and Michigan, but he needs to get those yards up. Uh, he's only at about 2,000 total yards, which is well below everyone else. And then I think if Tua Tungavailoa can come back, he's got 29 touchdowns and two picks, and he's missed a game, and he has a big statement game today. And if he wins this game, then he can even knock out Joe Burrow if he has a bad game, and Tua can come for it and Chase Young 13 and a half sacks through eight if he plays again this season I think that uh, he can come in and keep doing his thing I mean 13 I 13 and a half sacks through eight games is just insane and then uh, I think Jalen Hurts is definitely uh, he has the same stats basically that Kyler and Baker had at this point in the season he was at 800 rushing yards if he goes over a thousand he's gonna have definitely the most yards out of all the contenders in uh, total yards, and he's already at 34 touchdowns. If they went out and make the college football playoff, I think Jalen can definitely make a make a big splash in New York. All right, Dylan. Well, first of all, I want to say Chase Young, uh, although he is one of the best defensive linemen in the country, if not the best defensive lineman in the country, I don't know that he, to me, is really that top Heisman contender or really should be in the race per se because the only guy I can think of on the defensive line that really was up there was Ndamukong Su, who was the most unblockable player I think I've ever seen uh, in college football. But I'm taking Joe Burrow against the field. I think Joe Burrow should be the Heisman contender. Uh, and there's a little guy named uh, Kyler Murray, I think, who won the Heisman last year, and he said Joe Burrow should win the Heisman this year. Uh, he said Jalen Hurts is kind of that second tier right now because of the loss against Kansas State. And I totally agree, Kyler. If you're watching this right now, I want you to know that's a good point. You made a good point there. Joe Burrow is second in passing yards and passing touchdowns, third in passing efficiency. He has big wins against Texas, Florida, and Auburn last week. A meteoric rise from last year. Let me tell you, 2,805 yards, 30 touchdowns, four interceptions this season, right? Last season, 2,894 yards, 16 touchdowns, five interceptions from last year. That's an entire season versus what has been uh, a few games still shy of a full season this year, right? Uh, and he's only, what, maybe 90 yards short of, of passing himself from last year. Uh, 1,000 yards on the season against AP Top 25 opponents. Eight touchdowns against AP Top 25 opponents. Joe Burrow, to me, looks like the best quarterback on the field. If he's got the ball in his hands, you can bet LSU is going to be a contender for the national championship. All right. I like the Kyler quote. I didn't know that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Matt? You know, it's funny that you mentioned Kyler because, you know, you recall last year that a large part of the reason he was able to win the Heisman was because the guy who was, for a lot of people, just barely ahead of him, Tua had a bad game in the SEC title, which allowed Kyler to swoop in and steal the Heisman. So for me, the question here is, who's most likely to have a bad game? I think Joe Burrow, I look ahead and I see he's got to face probably two strong pass defenses, Alabama, and if the Tigers make the SEC title game, most likely Georgia. The Crimson Tide rank number three in the nation in yards per attempt allowed. They've allowed just under 5.5 yards per pass attempt. Bulldogs have allowed just over 5.7 to top 10 deep pass defenses in those metrics. They're both allowing less than 200 passing yards per game. So for me, I see another tight race. I see several possible guys who have a good shot to win it. 
and I think, I look ahead and I say, who's most likely to have a bad game? To me, that's Joe Burrow. I mean, you look at Jalen, the toughest pass defense he's had to face is probably K-State, and he still put up, like, what, 400 yards on them or something ridiculous like that. So I, I think it's more likely that we see Joe Burrow slip up than we do a guy like Jalen. Well, you and I had this conversation actually behind the scenes before the show. <laughs> we talked about, you know, maybe you're just a little bit more of a half, you know, glasses half full type of thing as me, and then glasses half empty as you, uh, because the way I look at it is those are opportunities for Joe Burrow to make his case for the Heisman. If he goes out and he performs against teams like Alabama or in the SEC championship, he has a big game, then you're talking about, you know, uh, he's a lock for the Heisman. If he goes out and he performs and he puts up, you know, 300 yards or so against Alabama's defense, you're going to be looking at it and you're going to say, well, you know, he put up those numbers. He's looked good all season. He's got him in the college football playoff race. He deserves the Heisman Trophy. Absolutely. Well, you're right. You're right. I think if Joe Burrow goes out yeah. and puts up numbers on Bama and puts up numbers on Georgia, he should absolutely win the Heisman. But I, looking at what I think is more likely to happen, I feel like it's more likely that he slips up and has a bad game than he goes out and dominates. I mean, that's fair. Looking at the defenses, you could say that, you know, those are tough defenses. It would be hard for Burrow to win a game against those guys and really go out and show out. Uh, but I'm just saying that, you know, there is that chance that he does. And so on that off chance that maybe he goes for a ton of yards and a ton of touchdowns, then, you know, maybe it's possible that he locks himself in. It's definitely hard to ignore the season Burroughs had. I think I was looking at his last year's stats. He could complete his next 14 passes out of 100 plus and still have a better completion percentage than he did last year. It's just, it's insane. Absolutely. You can't ignore that season. All right, well, after the break, we'll send you Beneath the Shadow of Owen Field with Shiloh, William, Christian, and Sam. They've got the full preview of the SEC Smackdown this afternoon between LSU and Alabama. You won't want to miss it. You're watching Game Day U. Some great stuff from our studio team. Now we're back at the remote. Everyone is talking about this game. Yeah. It's two versus three, oh, LSU and Alabama. I don't think anyone really is confidently saying who they think is going to win this game. But I'm going to ask y'all, who do you think is going to win this game? What do you think is going to happen? Does anyone have a quarter I can flip real quick? <laughs> right. I saw you. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, everything relies on Tua. That's the, the bottom line. We'll, we'll dive into some key points, each of us, I think. But everyone is go everything relies on whether Tua, how, how close to 100% he's going to be. Yeah. Simple yeah. as that. So, I've as of right now, I've got Alabama. But yeah, it's going to be a toss-up, and it's different from years past because this isn't going to be a game where it's going to be, you know, 14 to 10, 12 to 6, dirty kind of God, game. I hope not. This is going to be a game that's up in the high 20s, low 30s. Like it's going to be, there's going to be some points on that scoreboard today. Right. Yeah, I agree, and it, it it will rely a lot on whether or not Tua is 100, percent and whether or not he can fully trust uh, his ankle after having surgery. Mm -hmm. It's it's one of those things you kind of have like uh, I wouldn't say post-traumatic stress. But you kind of do have post-traumatic stress, whether or not you can trust that leg to be able to plan on it and make the mm -hmm. same plays you typically right. do. But I think I want LSU to win. Mm -hmm. But yeah. everyone wants LSU yeah. to win. I, I, I think, just kind of throw a little wrench in things. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I think uh, it, this will be a battle of coaching. Oh, and I yeah. think uh, I think Saban will come out on top at the end of it. I mean, don't don't respect my man, Coach L. Hey, go Tigers. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Go Tigers. Go run the ball. <laughs> I, love, I love Coach Trump. Yeah. Like, I... I the fact that the spread is six and a half points, we talked about this a little bit off air, is just boggling my mind. Like I just yeah. don't. Like, I'm sitting here. I'm like, I'm like the Zach, like verbal me and Zach Galifianakis trying to figure out the <laughs> math. <laughs> the over. Like I don't. I have no idea why in the world Alabama is a touchdown favorite. I, the l lower ranked opponent. And I get that it's at home and it's Alabama, but I mean, come on. They got six and a half. They got to know something we don't. What exactly. Is like, that's what I'm like. What do you know? <laughs> like, uh, what are the documents? Like, what do you know that I don't know? Like, yeah, did they put a, get, they like, put a robotic, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> robotic plays in? Like, this part know. Terminator now? It's going to be, a, hopefully, an incredible game. No doubt. Mm -hmm. I don't. So what are some of your keys for this game? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of 
a lot of matchups for this game just because there's so much talent across the board. Mm -hmm. One thing I think not a lot of people are talking about, everyone knows about Alabama's passing game, but are they going to be able to run the ball? That's something that's going to be key for me because that's something that they've struggled a little bit with so far this season. 63rd in the country at just under 170 yards per game, and they're going up against an LSU defense that's 13th in the country in terms of rush defense. So there's some talent on that front seven. There's some talent in Alabama's backfield. But they just haven't been able to utilize it yet. You know, Najee Harris is, is their key guy. And since Tua's injury, they've thrown the ball 33 times and ran the ball 59 times. So that really shows you, the, first of all, the confidence that they have in Mac Jones. And second of all, the emphasis that they're trying to place on the running back game. Najee Harris is the guy who is going to be the guy. And it's going to really help relieve a lot of pressure off Tua if they can find some success early getting the ball on the ground. Yeah, and I think... Uh, to counter that, I think LSU throwing the ball is going to be their biggest key throughout the game. It's, uh, we all know that Joe Burrow is, is the electric Heisman candidate that he now is. But the thing that's different about this LSU team than in years past is their ability to get the ball in the air and get fine receivers downfield. Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson are two of the most dynamic uh, receivers in college football. And Joe Burrow's got so many uh, weapons at his disposal. And they've put up 40 points in two of the three top AP top 25 uh, games that they've played so far. If they can do that against Alabama later today, I think they might have a chance of coming out on top. Yeah, and, and it's similar to that vein, like my, my takeaway is the Alabama defense uh, for similar reasons. I, I think we've talked so much this year about the offenses of these two teams uh, that it, especially with Alabama, who has historically had one of the best defensive units in the country. Uh, I, I wouldn't know. I, Will they be that good this year is kind of the question because they haven't played anybody. They have one ranked uh, win against Texas A&M, which they obviously dominated, but I think A&M's, I mean, we've it's all. It's A&M. It's A&M, yeah. exactly. Um, the 16th in total defense, 13th in passing defense, which yeah. will be interesting to watch, but 33rd in rushing defense. Like they, they, This team is vulnerable. They're very young, especially in the linebacking core. Uh, freshmen Shane Lee and Christian Harris are two of their top four tacklers. So like they, it's a young Alabama team, which is something you don't see very often. Like Saban has normally done a pretty good job of keeping a lot of experience in there, but they have a lot of freshmen and sophomores that are getting a lot of playing time. So can they step up? Can they make those plays when they need to? I think it's going to be really interesting to watch for me. I mean, like we said, they've dominated every game they've played so far. Yeah. But it's not going to be that way tonight. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not going to be that way tonight. Like, can they handle the pressure of playing a, a Joe Burrow? He's a Heisman kid for a reason. He's a really good quarterback. It'll be interesting to see how this defense. Yeah, when well, you talk about that. Well, dropped so. some uh, names so far, but who is going to be a like, player that like really makes a difference in this game, almost that X factor kind of a player for you guys? Yeah, a lot of talent in LSU secondary, uh, but I'm going to focus on Grant Delpit is going to be my guy, kind of the ball hawk leader of that secondary, maybe even of that defense. There's a lot of talent there, but he's one of the key guys mm -hmm. in the junior safety. Broke out in 2017, had a really good freshman year 2016. 2017 was a monster. Check out this stat line, 74 tackles, nine and a half tackles for loss, five sacks, five interceptions. This guy flies all over the field. He can get in the backfield and he can play well in coverage. This season, not as much though. 45 tackles, one and a half tackles for loss, one interception. Part of that is because of all the talent they've had on that team. You know, Derek Stingley Jr. is a, an amazing cornerback. Christian Fulton might be a first round pick this year. Glavon Chase in the linebacker, there's talent on that D-line. It's Part of it is also Grant Delphi dealing with an ankle injury he suffered at Auburn. And not being 100%, is that's going to be a huge key for me because they need that experience in the secondary. You've seen Alabama's wide receivers. Have you seen them? <laughs> no. Good and like, God, <laughs> they can fly. I, yeah. they, this LC secondary is going to be really tested today, and Grant Delphi's going to have to He's not going to be 100%, but he's going to have to play like he is for LSU to, to have a chance. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, Alabama's one of the few teams that can go three deep at wide receiver that can be, like, NFL talent caliber. Like, yeah. like Oklahoma's another yeah. one of those teams. Like, like Henry Ruggs is their third best wide receiver, and he has 513 yards and six touchdowns. Like, that, that's, that's not anything that's to not laugh funny. at. That's not even funny. It's just scary. I mean, we were just laughing, so it's got to be kind of funny. It's like, <laughs> our, it's like our sarcastic <coughs> sonic laugh. I feel we're like laughing the, at the fact that we don't have yeah, to go out on the field. We're afraid. We cover them. Yeah. Hey, maybe, maybe. I wouldn't want to line up against him. Maybe January 1st. Who knows? But, yeah, you talked about Alabama's receivers. They're disgusting. Jerry Judy is one of the most electric players I've seen, and he's able to create separation in ways I haven't, I haven't seen in a while. But mm -hmm. to reverse that, on the LSU receiving core, I'm a, I'm a receiver guy, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of the playmakers. I think Justin Isn't Jefferson. Isn't that what you played in high school? Hey, if you didn't know, I played high school football, yes. Wow. Um, did you play high school football? I did. Won a ring, actually, yeah. I yeah. played high school football. 
freshman year. Uh, yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's she was nice. probably yeah. 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 Right, right, right. yeah, no, my, my X Factor is going to have to be Justin Jefferson. Um, in these big games, coaches go to your receivers and your running backs and you tell them straight up, like, this is a big game. Big plays, big players make big plays in big games. And this is what uh, LSU is going to need out of Justin Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been kind of, his production in these big games against uh, Florida and Texas kind of slowed down. He did have a good game against Texas, but not in comparison to Jamar Chase. He didn't lead the receivers uh, like he typically does throughout the season. I think he's led the receivers in, in six of the nine games uh, to date. So Justin Jefferson's really going to need to kind of separate himself, get touches early. I understand he's a benefactor of what the quarterback does, but Justin, or Justin Burrow, uh, Joe Burrow lives for these big games and these big moments. So he's going to be able to uh, be on the money. So Justin Jefferson's really going to need to create separation. And it's going to be tough. Uh, Alabama's 13th ranked pass defense is, is, is nothing to, to joke around with. So um, I think he's going to be the key in LSU getting the win. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the, this, there's talent, like we said, talent all over the place in this game. Like, it's in, mm -hmm. the amount of NFL, like, per, this is easily the game of the year that's going to be the most, like, other than maybe the playoff, most NFL talent on the mm -hmm. field at the same time. Right. Like, it's, it's a lot of, to look at. But, I mean, if we're talking about the NFL, we're talking about talent. We have to mm -hmm. talk about Tua. Yeah. And Parker kind of made, our producer kind of made fun of me because when I wanted to pick my uh, key player, I picked Tua. But, I mean, <laughs> the man is first in total QBR at 95.8, 74% completion rate. Only set, getting, being sacked on 3% of dropouts this year, or dropbacks, I'm sorry. Like, he's an incredible talent. That's undeniable. The reason that he is a key to this game is, like we talked about, or like you both mentioned earlier, is he fully healthy, both mentally and physically? Like, can he mm -hmm. put it, like, put this ankle injury out of his mind? Because he had mm -hmm. a whole month and a half, basically, to recover from the last time he heard it. it was his other ankle, granted. But when he hurt his ankle last time and then had a month to recover, before he played Oklahoma in the playoff last year. I mean, he came out and looked incredible. Like, obviously, Alabama got like that Tua. win. He looked yeah. like Tua, and he looked yeah. like he should be. But he's only had three weeks, a little under three weeks, to recover from this one. Um, the, and even, then, even in that game against Oklahoma, he said he was in 100%. And I think he's going to have to be at 100% on three weeks recovery time to be, like, to be the, the quarterback that Alabama needs him to be. Because, like we said, like there is the margin of, like, while Vegas has a six-and-a-half point spread, I. I see the game a lot closer than that. Yeah. Like this, this is going to be one of those games that's going to come down to the come down to the wire. What's that one play that's going to define something? Like this is going to be one of those games that people look back on. Like I think, it, like hopefully, for all of college football fans, we want this to be an incredibly mm -hmm. hyped game. And like yeah. there, it just it's just not going to be it's the same if we have to see Mac Jones out there. Like no offense to Mac Jones. But you all the well, sort of. I don't, yeah, I don't sort think anyone sort of offense to Mac Jones. And I don't think anyone wants to see Mac Jones as a neutral fan. You know, like I, I, we want to see two at his best. I want to see Joe Burrow at his best. I want to see them slinging around. I mean, yeah. It's an over under of sixty three, which like I don't know the last time I've saw an over under sixty three between these two teams. I really don't either. So I'm ex I'm excited, but I I think the key to Alabama being able to win this game is whether or not two is going to be. <laughs> Yeah, so like you talked about uh, Alabama, Oklahoma last year. I, I honestly think if Tua were to come out on cast and boat on all extremities, they still would have beat us by 30. Like he, he just had to <laughs> hand, he just had to hand the ball up to Josh Jackson <coughs> and let him do his thing. It, they were running all over us. He, Tua really didn't have to do much. I mean, it yeah. helped when his wide receivers had five or six yards of space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. even got close late. Like don't forget. Hey, no, I did. Talk, we talked a lot of talked a lot about Charleston Rambo's mistakes today, but I mean, that, that, I mean no one wants to bring up that game either, but. Like, he came to play. He came, yeah. like they came back. Talk yeah. about stick to itiveness, but yeah. yeah, I mean that's one thing that he's got. Like we, like the the margins between these two teams are so small. Like offensive success rate, LSU is a fifty eight, Bam is a fifty seven. Uh, I mean num LSU is one of the the number one red zone offense. Uh, they're both kind of struggling in the, the run game. Sixty three for Alabama on rushing offense, seventy six for LSU. Like the the margins for these two teams are so slim. And then when you have games like that, it's so exciting to watch and see like who's gonna crack first, like which, like who's gonna get that first knockout punch. Yeah, I'm so excited. I'm excited. You, you can't tell. Like I'm really excited to watch this game. It's gonna be fun. <laughs> and it's not the same time as the Oklahoma game. God bless prime time. Like we're gonna and be actually, able to yeah, watch and then, cash and start yeah, we're gonna like be able to mm -hmm. watch the game, which will be fun. Right. It's wild. We get to watch the big games. We get to watch, and we want to watch. We what? do. Unbelievable. <laughs> On a Saturday, a day dedicated to I college know. football, we actually get to watch college football. Yeah, what it's crazy. Blessing. Get out of town. We're what the luckiest blessing. people out there. Wildest. <laughs> Y'all are crazy this morning. Well, if it is you, early. 
if you had to give a score prediction, a hard number count, because we've been talking <coughs> over oh, over, man. we've been talking the spread. I I know y'all are some betting boys, yeah. so Unfortunately. give it to me. Um, <laughs> if I had to put a man, it's so hard. If I had to put a number on it, I'd probably it's go. Tough. It's tough. As of right now, like off of instinct, I'd go, I'd go 37-31 Alabama. Ooh, I think okay. this is gonna be a high-scoring game. I think this is gonna be different. There's a lot of excitement You're building off the, this. The difference, like spot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm like that's right how you cover the That's how. You, that's all it always is. You can never, you can never get cocky about the line. As if they're easily gonna get the line. It's yeah. never gonna be that way. It seems like I can always bet the over and, uh, with a few teams. It, it, they never fail me. But I, I, I think I'll probably go 31-27 Bama. I, uh, I think it'll be a close game and. Uh, a few field goals would get kicked here and there. Yeah. Not many. A few touchdowns. Sure. Nothing big. I mean, that's an underrated storyline of this game. Like, I mean, field goals have won, have been the difference in like a lot of the marquee LSU Alabama games. I mean, that obviously the 12 to nine game was, or the nine to six game. I'm sorry, <laughs> is was. Hopefully, that's not what we see <laughs> later today. But I, mean, I, I think that with the way these teams' defenses are playing and how like incredible they are, like. These kickers better come to play. Like yeah. they better be ready to go because they're they're gonna be like points are gonna be few and far between between these two teams, and I think it'll be like it could come down to the wire. Like, it could it could come down to that kind of play, like a, just a fifty yard banger from distance. I know? could use Gabe Barkage. <laughs> no, <laughs> <have>, no. Right. <laughs> well, guys, that's all for us for now. We're gonna toss it back to the in studio team, and they're gonna give you some numbers on what they think is going to be happening with in the national landscape. Don't go anywhere. Thanks for joining us this morning on Game Day U. I'm Meredith Mulkey, and coming up in just a bit, our own Parker Thune sits down with Sooner Scoops' Eddie Radoskovich. But for now, we'll keep it here in the studio with Matt Bowling, Dylan Rivera, and Zach Verdia. Guys, I'm going to give you a few different case scenarios here. I want to know what the odds are that these are going to come true, all right? So first off, let's talk Notre Dame and head coach Brian Kelly. Is there going to be a job opening after this? Is he gone after the two losses? What do you think, Zach? Uh, well, I'm going to say he's not gone just quite yet. I'm going to go 45%. Just right close to that 50% marker. Uh, I just think Brian Kelly, he's been there a while, longer than you would think before going back and looking at it. But uh, he, he's been better than Notre Dame standards the, the last uh, three coaches, really, since Lou Holtz. They really haven't been good 10-win team like, uh, like they had been in the past, like everyone thinks Notre Dame is, uh, of blue blood. But, I mean, Charlie Weiss was was pretty bad for him. Had a three and nine season and a couple seven and sixes before they canned him. Tyrone Willingham only lasted three years. Five and seven, six and five got him out. Brian Kelly really hasn't had multiple seasons like they had that got him fired. I mean, even if you go back to 97 to 2000, Bob Davey had two five win seasons that finally got him out. So it feels like you have to have a couple pretty crap, uh, bad seasons for uh, to get fired at Notre Dame. So I'm gonna go with 45%, like he could get fired, but eh, maybe not. Maybe not, maybe so. All right, Dylan. Well, yeah, I kind of agree with that point. I'm going to echo the, the, you know, the sentiment that Notre Dame seems like they're pretty trusting of their head coaches because he has had a couple of bad years. Uh, but so far, I mean, he's done all right this year, and he had a college football playoff appearance last year, so I'm saying only about 30% is my percentage as far as whether that job will be open or not. I think Brian Kelly sticks around for next year. I think there's a good chance he's, this, he's the guy for the future. I think he's the guy that they're going to have for the next few years. And one of those main reasons is that you look at the recruiting class, they've got two five-stars, right? And they're number nine in the country right now as far as recruiting class goes. So when you look at those, uh, you know, that recruiting class, he's still bringing guys in of top talent. And when you look at that, that means, okay, well, people still want to come play for him. And as long as people still want to come play for him, your program's going to be relevant. Uh, and then I, I looked at it, you know, from a perspective of if they were to fire him, who would replace him? Obviously, people are going to mention Urban Meyer. That's going to be the one that everybody's going to say. But at the same time, I don't think Urban Meyer's coming back. I don't think he's going to make a return to coaching. I think this time he really is done with coaching. Uh, I, I look at maybe Chris Peterson at Washington if he wanted to leave his job at Washington. Uh, Mike Norville from Memphis has had a good season. Uh, Brian Harson from Boise State has had a good season. So a couple of guys that maybe are a possibility, but there's nobody that really sticks out to me like a sore thumb that says, that's the guy that needs to take the Notre Dame job. So I think they stay with Brian Kelly. All right, Matt. Man, I'm going 10%. I mean, Brian Kelly, look, I, I don't think he's not going anywhere unless he wants to. The only thing that I could see happening 
is maybe Florida State throws the bag at him. But even then, why would you take on the task of rebuilding that program when you've got a perennial top 25 team right now? He's coming off a CFP appearance. He's got a great chance to notch the third 10-win season in a row. And he's stated for years that he's happy where he is. He doesn't want to leave Notre Dame. So, no, I think unless something crazy happens, Brian Kelly is still going to be the Notre Dame head coach next year. All right. Well, let's talk NFL draft. What are the odds that a non-quarterback will be the first pick? I'm going to go pretty low here. I'm going to go 5%. I feel like there's a lot of teams out there that could, uh, not a lot, but there's few bad teams out there that could use a quarterback. And with the quarterbacks out there right now, I think Tua Tagovailoa is still uh, the number one pick in the draft right now. And I know the Miami Dolphins love Tua right now. Their owner, Stephen Ross, has allegedly been infatuated with him for over a year now. Joe Burrow is an Ohio guy through and through, so he could, uh, the Bengals will probably be targeting him. And even if you go farther than that, Justin Herbert, if he can, if he can uh, get his stock up, you never know what happens after the season. We saw people like Cam Newton just rise to the top and get drafted first overall. Herbert's 6'6", 237, and I know McShea and, and Kuiper are going to love that size. And then Jalen Hurts, if he wins out, wins the Heisman, keeps putting up the numbers he has, over 1,000 yards, people in the NFL like Lamar Jackson, and we saw Kyler get drafted last year, Baker. We can see the late push that you can get be the first overall pick when people aren't expecting it throughout the entire season. I think Jalen can uh, can make a push for that. All right. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of agree with that sentiment, and 5% is a very low percent, but I'm going to beat you out, Zach. I'm going to go 0% chance. I think it absolutely will be a quarterback at that number one spot, especially looking at the fact that the Bengals right now hold sole possession of that number one pick, and the Bengals, as we know, just benched Andy Dalton. And on top of that, just hired a guy named Zach Taylor, a Norman High guy, actually just down the road, right, uh, as head coach. And he did a great job with Jared Goff, but you got to think he wants to get his own quarterback in there. He wants to have his franchise guy. And we've seen that happen with Cliff Kingsbury last year, bringing in Kingsbury. They draft Kyler Murray number one instead of maybe uh, a Bosa brother, right? Nick Bosa could have gone number yep. one. And instead they say, okay, well, let's get Kyler, let's get the quarterback of his choice in there. Kind of the same thinking, line of thinking, I would think, here in Cincinnati. Uh, on top of that, the Dolphins are up there at the number four pick right now. You got to think that maybe they're a possibility. You got to think about other quarterback needy teams that are maybe down the line. Washington, maybe. I mean, obviously they drafted Dwayne Haskins, uh, but their quarterback situation has not been very good. Dwayne Haskins struggled that one game he came out. I think he had three or four interceptions. It was a bad game for him. Obviously, Case Keenum is not the answer. Uh, Tampa Bay you know, is projected Smith. at number eight right now. Jameis Winston is not the future of their franchise. Denver is still looking for answers with Joe Flacco out and uh, you know obviously Drew Locke had an okay look to, to him before the season but then as the season started to begin and the preseason started growing he, he didn't look that good. Not so, Brian, buying the Brandon Allen stock yet? No, no well Brandon Allen no I'm not I'm not on that yet <laughs> I'm gonna need not. to see more from him but uh, like you mentioned Burroughs up there two was up there Herbert's up there. I think Fromm is still, you know, maybe in that conversation for a first-round pick. He's not a top pick, obviously, uh, but he, he could definitely still be a first-round pick. I know you hate that, Matt, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I would say those guys are all up there as competition. I want to echo that point you say about Joe Burrow being an Ohio guy. Yeah. So I think he has a really uh, a like likely chance of going to Cincinnati because he's from Athens, Ohio. I did my research. I did. I even did the Google Maps to see how far he is. Ohio, Two and a half hour drive yeah. from Cincinnati. So that tells Impressive you, that you looked that he's up. an Ohio guy. <laughs> so you got to think the Bengals are looking at him. All right, Matt. I, I see a little bit more possibility here. I'm going to go 33 percent. I think you know, like you said, the two teams that are most likely to get the top draft pick. Dolphins, Bengals, both of them will probably take a quarterback. It's pretty clear that neither Ryan Fitzpatrick nor Josh Rosen is the long-term answer for Miami. Fitzpatrick because he's old and bad, and Rosen because, well, he's just bad. Uh, Cincinnati, meanwhile, it's looking like Andy Dalton's best days are behind him. You see here he throws back-to-back -back interceptions He's been benched for Ryan Finley, and unless Ryan Finley turns out to be another Gardner Minshew, I would expect the Bengals to take a quarterback. Now, the reason that I give it about a one in three chance of a non-quarterback going, uh, going number one is because if you look ahead at the rest of the season, there are multiple potential wins on the Dolphins and Bengals schedules. For one thing, they play each other, they 
play the Browns, they play the Jets. One of those teams may be, one or both of those teams may be rattling off a couple wins. Leaves room for a team like the Redskins or perhaps the Jets, both of whom have already taken their quarterbacks of the future, to sneak in and get that number one spot, in which case they would not go quarterback. All right, well, this is the part that I know you guys have been waiting to talk about, NCAA. So let's talk about it. Their fair pay to play has been approved. Likely we'll be seeing uh, players in the future getting paid for their image, their name, their likeness. Um, what do you guys think about this, and what are the odds that the NCAA video game is coming back? I love this 90%. I, can't, I, I couldn't commit the full 100 I can't not wait for this game to come back. Obviously, that's the first thing that I that even came to mind whenever I heard about this rule. Obviously, the pay for the players is pretty nice, but uh, this video game will is always big. It's kind of been a uh, lifeblood uh, for the last six years. People just playing the old game, downloading the rosters. I think that this can be pretty big for the NCAA, the rule, because I mean we hear a lot about how. It kind of feels like it could turn into like a free minor league, a free uh, minor league system for the NFL. When I mean they're already putting their bodies out there for free, uh, for almost three, four years. So I think that this uh, this can only help the student athletes going forward. And I think this uh, NCAA game will be back for sure. Yeah, I'm a fan of, of the the fair pay to play act. I'm a fan of uh, what's going on in college football. Uh, I myself am a player of NCAA <laughs> football. I still have 14 in my bedroom at my apartment <laughs> and I play that from time to time. So I'm saying it's a 99% chance that NCAA football makes its return here pretty soon. I mean, obviously it's not gonna happen immediately. There's still some kinks that have to be worked out. And uh, you know, the, the EA Sports would have to, you know, get all the rights and all of that and go through all those progressions that, you know, would have to, you know, come with making a new game. But the way I look at it, and I looked at the numbers. I, I, I'm a very statistically <laughs> driven person, if you haven't noticed. EA Sports made $3.8 billion off of their last game. All right? If they came out with a new one, a return franchise, with, with fans from yesteryear and new younger fans nowadays, you got to imagine that's a 4 to $5 billion franchise right there. And with EA Sports kind of, uh, you know, calling it quits on their NBA, you got live games, and obviously Madden isn't doing the best that it could right now. you got to think that EA Sports is saying NCAA football can come back Yes, please. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, I'm only going to go 50 50. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, like you said, yeah, you're right. E EA Sports, definitely, they should do it. They would have every reason to do it given how great the demand would be. But I think we underestimate a little bit because the lack of a college players union like the NFL has means that they would have to get permission from each individual player to use their name and likeness. That is a logistical nightmare. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they could do it. I think, I think they should pursue it. It seems like it would be a great business decision. But the logistics and the hurdles, to me, I see how that could really hinder things. Well, and I get that point of things, and, and I wrote that down in my notes that you may say that because I knew you were talking <laughs> about that the other day. So I was prepared for that point. And here's what I was going to say to that point was if – you say EA's got to go around it and, and get permission from every player. I understand that's a big hurdle. That's going to take a long time. you got to think every football roster's got, you know, 100 guys, it seems like, uh, from top to bottom that, that really uh, would be in the game. And you'd have to go and get, you know, every single one of their, you know, consent to be in the game, right? But here's the thing. They're going to make money off of that, right? So if I'm making money to be in a video game, what's the negative <laughs> to that? Why would I not sign on for that? Why would I not give my consent to EA to be in the game. And so if EA is smart about it, they'll go around, they'll probably just, you know, print off 100 different copies of, you know, whatever <laughs> they need them to sign and go into the football team, go into the office and say, all right, guys, if you want to be in the game, sign this. If you don't, you don't have to. You can sit in your locker room and be a bum and not be <laughs> yeah. in the game, you know? Yeah, I'm, so <laughs> I, I like think you it's, said, yeah. I think yeah. I'm sure that teams have plenty of times where they have to sign, everyone's got to sign a contract or something. Mm -hmm. Like, just print out a ton of them line up and start <laughs> signing it like let's go if, if they're raking in that kind of money then who's gonna say no yeah, sure. exactly yeah but you know i think we can all agree also this uh this fair play to fair pay to play act letting people be compensated for the use of their name image and likeness is the right thing to do yeah and i think even outside of football landscape you know we're talking about other sports it doesn't just cover just football and that's what we always think because it's you know the, the biggest market and so we're always thinking about you know the football side of things but really that goes all the way down to teams like the tennis teams the golf teams you know guys who 
uh, don't get a lot of coverage maybe if their likeness is used they will make some money off of it and these are just like college football players they're putting in hours and hours of practice and yeah maybe maybe in tennis and golf you're not putting your <laughs> body on the line but you can make some money for all that time that you're spending that maybe you could be using for a part-time job you know yeah all right well when we come back shiloh william christian and sam get ready get you ready for the oklahoma and iowa state from the Palace on the Prairie, they've got final words, they've got call-outs, and they've got score predictions as Game Day U rolls on. What's up, Sooner football fans? Welcome back to Game Day U. Parker Thune here alongside Eddie Radosevic. Eddie, my man, thank you so much Absolutely. for taking time. For sure. Thanks for having me out. Yeah, you know, this segment is called Hit the Books. We're usually okay. situated well, in I didn't really do that a whole lot during college. Well, see, yeah, you're not a books guy, I'm not a books guy. Okay. So I figured chill, chill out on the couch this time. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, first things first, I don't want to improperly credential you, so why don't you go ahead and give us your full list of affiliations. <laughs> uh, I work for SoonerScoop.com, uh, Rivals Network, and then obviously uh, Franchise Morning Show 107.7 uh, here in Oklahoma City, so statewide operation, but it's a lot of fun. Good to be back. I haven't been back in uh, Gaylord in a while. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you. I heard you were a weather liaison somewhere. I do some like weather that. liaison. Oh, you wanted me to do the entire thing. Yeah, uh, KF4 weather liaison uh, in your corner. Uh, sometimes KOKH, KOCO, uh, still haven't been invited on News 9, but we're working on that one. Working on it, all right. Okay, well, I want to start with the obvious. Horns up for peace, man? I don't know. I don't know if I can get with you on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's a lot of people that are still uh, in campus or on campus that uh, didn't really. Uh, some people just don't get it. It's obviously a dig at Texas. Uh, we had a good time with it. It's actually uh, the one year anniversary uh, was yesterday of when we started it. Me and Jason Kersey from The Athletic. So uh, it's been uh, quite the ride. I mean, uh, Game Day picked it up for a little segment a couple of weeks ago. It's it's been fun though. I think everybody mostly kind of gets what's going on uh, with the uh, with the intention of it. So uh, the whole thing is just ridiculous. And who knows? I thought they'd get around too, but it doesn't seem like Texas is gonna be back in Arlington unless they run the table. So uh, it will be uh, it'll be interesting, but it's been fun for uh, what it is. Certainly, yeah. Iowa State coming to town this weekend. Obviously, things didn't go so well the last time they were here. So uh, what, what yeah. kind of vibes you get in this time around? You know, I, I certainly don't think that this team is, uh, you know, as big of a threat maybe as, as some other teams would have been. Uh, it's kind of a weird spot for you, obviously, coming off of the, the loss in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, I, 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 Iowa State was kind of that sexy team at the beginning of the year. and. I never really bought into it, just for the fact that, you know, you lose Hakeem Butler, I thought he made a lot of plays, obviously he had a hell of a game against Oklahoma last year up in Ames. You know, Brock Purdy's just been up and down, and he's been uh, susceptible to turning the ball over, something that Oklahoma hasn't been able to do, so I think that's going to kind of be a unique, uh, uh, I guess, game line going into the into the game Saturday, with just the fact that, can Oklahoma start forcing turnovers? You're going to have to do that in November if you want to get back to Arlington. If you want to get to a fifth Big 12 championship game, and uh, you know, I think that there's a lot that goes into uh, the reasons why Oklahoma hasn't been playing maybe as well as as others would have thought, or I guess specifically in the Kansas State game. But we'll see. I mean, it's it's kind of an interesting matchup. Matt Campbell's really good, obviously, and. Uh, the last time he was in Norman, they won. So, I mean, I, I think that it's going to be a, a fun matchup come Saturday night. What are you looking for from the Sooners scheme-wise to try and snap the funk that we saw in Manhattan? Yeah, I mean, it, it was just kind of, uh, it sounds so cliche to say it, but it was just like the perfect storm for Oklahoma. You're not able to get off the field on third down. Uh, you know, you're able to let them convert second and 23s, uh, third and 10 twice, a fourth and six that went for a touchdown. Uh, you lose the turnover battle, and all of that is kind of a summation of, of why they got beat and had to make the, the final ditch effort there in the fourth quarter when you're down by 25. So, uh, you know, they I, I think that we're going to see Oklahoma. They're more of the team that you saw the first seven weeks than what you saw in Manhattan. It was just kind of the perfect storm. Kansas State played the game that, you know, Kansas State had to play if they were going to beat Oklahoma, and that was controlling the clock, winning the turnover battle, and everything that went into that. So. I think they'll run more than six plays in the third quarter, though, come this weekend. But, uh, you know, I think that it will be, uh, it should be a good bounce back game for Oklahoma. And then you prepare for kind of what will be a, a true gauntlet as far as having Baylor and then, uh, of course, having to go to Stillwater the final week of the year. TCU kind of in between. Eddie Radosevich, thank you so much Absolutely. for your time. Absolutely. Appreciate time. you. I'll send you back outside to Shiloh, William, Christian, and Sam, guys. Hey, say it with your chest back there.
Hey guys, um, we are in our very last block here, so you know what time it is. It's time for final words, so call out. I know. He's been crying. It will be, we'll be in Waco down. next Score week. Prediction. Yay. Prime time. Yay. <laughs> what Waco. Is this dance? You mean Waco. <laughs> in the shoulder. It's prime time, baby. You mean Waco. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and start. Um, we're going to start off with final word. Sam, what's yours? Yeah, final word today is going to be like an eraser. We're just going to erase. Yeah. We're just going to erase everything that's happened over the last, over the, all the conversation, all the questions that have risen over the last two weeks. This is not about Kansas State. That game is in the past. And from what it sounds like throughout the week, these players have been good at getting over that game and getting moving past it. Kenneth Murray said during the bye week, you didn't really look back on it too much, look forward. And that's great and all. But you don't. You say that, but then you go out here at seven o'clock at Gable Memorial Stadium. You've got to show it. You've just got to erase everything you got. They've had two weeks to work on all these these little things, these little things here and there. The coverage, you know, not letting the containment, the penalties. They've had two weeks to work on all that. So you just got to erase all the memory you've had at Kansas State because it's a whole new week, it's a whole new game, it's a whole new season. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to go with rebound. I think my, my key for this team is to rebound off the loss of Kansas State and really take it to Iowa State uh, later tonight. Uh, they've got the, really oppor the opportunity to, uh, to show that um, this loss was a fluke, to say, to say and to be completely honest. Um, they need to go out and rebound against Iowa State and really take it to them. Uh, yeah, I agree with both of the things that you guys have said. Uh, my word is antidote, uh, as in you ate, like the rat, Scott. You, you ate the rat poison. You know, like they, they ate it. Like they sat on the rat poison. They were like, that's rat poison. And then they were like, I'm going to eat it anyway. Yeah. Like, so you got to get the poison out of your system. Find the antidote. Find the antidote. Get out there. Do what you're capable of doing. And then I think you can go from there. But you got to start championship November off strong. Get the poison out of your system. Christian, I went for the fist bump after the Travis Scott bit, and you turned right away. Yeah, really? it was sad. He made a sad face. It's okay. I thought you were going to be out. Leaving him hanging on live yeah. TV. Oh, I'm sorry, brother. Brutal. There you yeah. go. Do you feel better now? Just Good. a little bit, yeah. Can I, can I do my final word now? Now that you're so fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Fine. <laughs> it's all about saying. Think about it. Well, my final word is very much in alignment with you guys. Is it's bounce, as in they need to bounce back. I mean, it's as simple so. as Christian put it, that it was a fluke loss. Um, a lot of things went into that loss. Home crowd, homecoming. I mean, it was a crazy game for sure. I think that they need to take that, focus on it like they have during the bye week, and now go into Iowa State with a new set of, like, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it. Um, definitely they need to bounce back and get back to that same level of play that we always expect from the Sooners. Um, we haven't been seeing that as often, and I think they now realize it with that loss, and they're gonna they're gonna whip into shape. I hope so. Yeah. That's, That's another too. Travis Scott bit, actually. Whip into shape. Whip. Huh. Never mind. So we can do one words, and that means trap. That's a song. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, uh, I'm just gonna, gonna I'm just gonna pretend yeah. I didn't. You sing. need to you spend some time <laughs> off Spotify because you're like just popping with all yeah. these music uh, references. Everyone, everyone's got their hobbies. <laughs> I, got mine. Yeah, I can't blame you. I can't blame you, Travis. Kanye. Keep Ooh. going. <laughs> well, we're it's not true. even going to get it's into true. that. Well, speaking of it's musical back. call outs, what's your football call outs? My football call out, uh, we've mentioned him several times so far this show, but I, first time call out on the show Alex Grinch, welcome to the call out Ooh. section. <laughs> Two words okay. describe Alex Grinch's attitude and really the defense's attitude uh, following the Kansas State loss, and he said it a lot during media on uh, Monday. I failed. I failed to put my players in position to succeed. I failed in my scheme and I failed in my game plan. That's what he was. He was very honest, very blunt, and it was kind of refreshing. Like like Sule mentioned, our old defensive coordinator and, and the reactions to losses and stuff like that. And Alex Grinch's mentality is something that's really interesting. And, and it starts with him. It's got to start from him and building that trust back with the players in the scheme and in, the, in each other. So I'm interested to see what kind of adjustments Alex Grinch makes on the defensive side, especially against a good quarterback in Brock Purdy, a talented running back in Brees Hall. He can't really mess around here. He's got to he's got to make sure those adjustments work out. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go with Trey Sermon. It seems like the again. Um, <laughs> it seems like the umpteenth time. I've Welcome to up. your fifth fifth segment on the show, dude. Because I really think the sky is the limit for this guy, Trey Sermon, and he really hasn't taken advantage of the opportunities that he's had to date. I know that his touches have severely decreased since the beginning of the season, and. And when your touches decrease, you got to make the most of the small touches, the small amount of touches that you get. So I'm really looking for Trey Sermon to, to make an impact on the five or six times he touches the ball and earn 
your job to get more touches. Yeah, I mean, he's basically been obsolete. A complete non-factor. The you running have to, backs. Have you have to, yeah, you have to exactly wonder how that how that has happened. I don't you know? know what's going on within the running back room and um, prioritizing Jalen Hurts as a primary runner for this offense. I mean, it's working. Don't get me wrong, but you've got running backs. It's you've got, nice. you've it's got becoming, great running it's backs. Becoming, it's becoming it's predictable. Everybody. I think. Well, yeah. yeah, I think it's starting. It you're starting to see defenses adjust to it a little better, and they know where Jalen's looking, and they know when he's going to go for the run. So. Yeah. You got to get them involved. Yeah, I mean that kind of leads into my call out. And uh, as far as I know, the first time he's made an appearance on this show this year, at least, I'm, I, I'm calling out Lincoln Riley. And this year, I this called year. him out last year. Okay, this year I'm calling out Lincoln Riley. The last four years, Lincoln Oklahoma Riley. has lost in the regular season to an unranked opponent. And while not all of those were under your tenure, it still is becoming a trend that we don't want to see at Oklahoma. And at this point, we have a lot of problems to fix. The defense needs to get fixed. The running backs need to get their crap together. <laughs> like, do not let this team go on a downward trajectory. This is a very crucial time in the year. And if we, if Lincoln Riley can't rally the troops, I mean, he's done it before, and I'm, I'm calling you out, do it again. Like, you've proven that you can take a one-loss team to a college football playoff. Do it again. I, like, I want to, I think all of us want to see that happen, because we'd probably get to go, which would be cool. But, like, yeah, nice. I don't want to see like this. If this comes becomes a thing every year, like going into the future, you have to be able to get your team ready for every game, ranked or not. Yeah. Point blank period. Well, I don't have just one call out. I'm calling out a group of people, and that would be the offensive line. I mean, over and over again, we're seeing Jalen have to scramble out of sticky situations. There's so much pressure being put in the pocket, and much to what you know, you guys had to say. A lot of times that they are keeping an eye on Jalen to run the ball, and they are expecting that out of him because he is, well, one of our lead running backs, even though he's not even a running back. So <laughs> they are expecting him to bob and weave in and out of the pocket, and because of that, they are surrounding him. Um, I just think that the line needs to do better of protecting Jalen. It almost seems like in case safe there were times where he was like, immediately put into a scramble situation like no one was there to stop anyone which uh i mean you just can't be successful that way i it's mean we had <laughs> such a great offensive line last season and that's why kyler was able to do and come back the way he was able to um when the defense starts to falter and you can't give your quarterback time to make those big plays happen then there's no way that you can really you know have that comeback, have that, you know, kind of underdog mentality. Yeah, and to your point, Shiloh, I, I, I do agree with you. The offensive line does need to step up uh, mm -hmm. marginally. But it really is uh, – I've noticed that Jalen Hurts kind of sits in the pocket for longer than is average and typical for quarterbacks. Typically in quarterback dropbacks, you're expected to have three seconds here and there mm -hmm. uh, to get the ball out of your hands. Right. It seems like he's holding it for a little bit longer than that. Yeah. Well, quickly, um, who do you think is going to win and what's the score for the game? Uh, yeah, I'll go with Oklahoma for this one. I think they bounce back and take the game 41-23. to 23. I think the defense will start out a little slow. We'll still show some of those, those questions that rose just because they're coming off the bye week. But I think they solidify things in the second half. They're not going to have a bad third quarter like they did against Kansas State. They're going to look to come out the second half gates really strong. Yeah, uh, I'm going to have to agree with you on that one. I think OU will rebound really well. I'm going to have to go with the final score of OU 49-24. to 24. Um, I, I do believe uh, Oklahoma is really going to come back and, and show their dominance. I think there will be some growing pains with this defense, not really growing pains per se, but um, they will allow some big plays, and it, it, that kind of thing happens during a game. So I think OU will uh, end up beating them by 25. Yeah, and my score is along the same line as everybody else's, but I, I do have an interesting stat that our producer told me earlier today. There are three teams. Why did he tell you and not us? Because I was in the room. I don't know. <laughs> There are three teams since 2017 that have never that have not lost by double digit points. Iowa State, Oklahoma, Washington. So I I think that trend ends today. I just think it's something to keep note of. Iowa State in the last couple of years, especially under Matt Campbell, have been a competitive team in every single game they've played. Mm -hmm. And even before they really got good and they got to the point where they are now, um, it'll be like I wouldn't be surprised if they keep this close. It's like more, the spread's 14 and a half. Um, I think all of us have OU covering that. But I think coming off this week, coming off a of bye week, it's it's seems like a good time for Oklahoma to come out the gates and really blow them away. I mean, my score prediction is 45-28, but I also wouldn't be surprised at the end of the night to have a very close game on our hands. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, am the atmosphere is going to be yeah. awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Um, yeah, my numbers are really similar. I've got OU uh, coming out on top, 45-21. Uh, simply put, I think that the Sooners are going to be starving. They're not going to be alligators, sure. that they are really going to come out here and do whatever they can to win. Um, and because of that, I think they're going to run up the score as much as possible. However, I mean, Iowa State is, is not a bad team by any means. I mean, they are solid when they need to be. Do I think that they are like Oklahoma level? Absolutely not. But I do think that they'll be able to put up some points on the board. Um, we might, like you said, have some growing pains, have some defensive um, woes here or there. But uh, overall, that's all the time that we have today um, from our end of things. Uh, we still have one more uh, segment from our in-studio team, so make sure not to go anywhere. Um, but yeah, we're going to be at the game later today, and we'll see you again next week. Well, we're here to wrap things up on Game Day U. Meredith Mulkey alongside Matt Bowling, Dylan Rivera, and Zach Verdia. Guys, obviously we've touched on the numerous marquee matchups that are on slate today, but it's decision time. Let's hear your official picks. We're going to start things off with Iowa and Wisconsin, two teams that started hot and have fallen upon hard times lately. It wasn't long ago that the Hawkeyes were 4-0, but their offense struggled mightily in losses to Michigan and Penn State. The next two weeks will define their season. A date with Minnesota is on deck after today's tilt with the Badgers. If Iowa hopes to play for the Big Ten title, both games are must-win matchups. Meanwhile, Wisconsin is reeling. An improbable upset loss to Illinois derailed their playoff hopes. An object thrashing at the hands of Ohio State effectively ended those hopes. However, a win today would very much keep the Badgers in the running for the Big Ten East crown and a trip to Indianapolis where they just might get a crack at revenge on the Buckeyes. Guys, who gets the win on this one today? Uh, it's probably not too smart to give Wisconsin three straight losses, but I think I was going to pull this one out. They have a great defensive line, only gives up about 88 yards per game, and they're going to have a huge test today, by far the biggest of the season for them in Jonathan Taylor. But Iowa keeps these games close. They, I mean, uh, Dylan already mentioned it earlier when we were talking about if they're a real contender. They lost to Penn State by five, Michigan by seven. They keep, they stay in these games, and they have a defense that can that can keep it low scoring, and that's exactly what they need with their offense. But uh, I think that they can, that it'll be close in the fourth quarter, and that Iowa can squeak out another upset, and Wisconsin's just gonna plummet down. All right, Dylan, who do you think? Yeah, I think you're right on those two kind of low scoring losses, but at the same time. Uh, they, they barely beat out Purdue and barely beat out Northwestern. So I'm taking Wisconsin against the Hawkeyes today. I think Wisconsin with that still number one total defense, you know, we talk about how they lost to Ohio State, they lost to Illinois. They are still the best defense in the country. That is a fact. So when you look at that and then the fact that they're coming off two straight losses, I think this is the time that Wisconsin gets back on track. They get a win against Iowa and they start rolling again. Here's a fun fact for you, Zach. Wisconsin hasn't lost three games in a row since 2008, the year their scout team Player of the Year award went to a guy named J.J. Watt. The, I don't know the that Badgers, guy. the <laughs> Badgers have had a bye week to regroup. I think they're going to come out hot. They're they're going to win. I, All right. I can't put my trust in Jack Cohn I, after that Illinois game, just that terrible interception. That's all I can see in my head. Okay, well, on we go. Penn State visits Minnesota today, and both teams have an opportunity to make a huge statement. Forgive, forgive the Golden Gophers if they feel just a bit disrespected by the college football playoff committee. They're the lowest ranked unbeaten by a long shot, and they're stuck behind six teams with two losses. But if P.J. Fleck and company can row the boat to a victory today, they can reverse that whole narrative. Meanwhile, the committee sang a different tune as far as Penn State was concerned. As we mentioned earlier, the, earlier, the Nitt Nittany Lions shockingly jumped Clemson to claim the fourth slot in the poll. James Flank Franklin's team has its share of dissenters, but they've already beaten Iowa and Michigan, and if they can escape with a win today, all signs point toward a matchup of unbeatens where they head to the horseshoe on November 23rd to take on Ohio State. Zach, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think that Ohio State game with Penn State might be uh, not as great as everyone thinks because I think Minnesota's going to take this game. This is the biggest game in like Minnesota history. These fans have never seen it, will never have an atmosphere like this or a game like this for maybe a long time if they don't win it. Uh, they're a six and a half point dog at home. Uh, P.J. Fleck, they're 8-0. He's just got that big deal. The crowd's going to be crazy. To go along with Rodney Smith, he's had five straight 100-yard games. He's averaging over 120 yards 
on the ground per game in Big Ten play. And uh, I just think that Minnesota's gonna have that, gonna have that atmosphere. They're 50% on third downs for the whole season. So I think Minnesota, with that home crowd, is gonna pull off a big upset today and uh, knock Penn State out of the college football top four. Oh, right. I'll keep this one pretty short. I think that <laughs> Penn State's going to win it. I think uh, Minnesota's a, a decent team. They're a good team. P.J. Fleck, I'm going to give him his, his credit. You know, he has definitely built this program up into a much better team than it has been in the past, but Penn State is the favorite today. Penn State should walk away the winner, although maybe, you know, we've had some different conversations about college football playoff rankings. I still think they are uh, the one who comes out with the win today. You going to row the boat with me, Matt? <laughs> There's a reason I like to refer to James Franklin as great value Davo Sweeney. He has a very similar personality, but little to none of Sweeney's ability to win big games. Franklin is 1-11 on the road against ranked opponents. Today, he will get outcoached by P.J. Fleck as the, as the Gophers row the boat towards a division title. All right. I like it. I like the movements. With you. <laughs> Row the you boat. can just sit there. Row I'm not, I'm not the in the boat. boat. I'm not in the boat. <laughs> All right. Well, it's the moment of truth. The biggest game of the day, biggest game of the year, and maybe even the biggest game of the decade. Ed Orgeron and LSU bring a prolific passing attack and ferocious secondary to Tuscaloosa, Tuscaloosa where Nick Saban's Crimson Tide await. Two fantastic coaches, two phenomenal quarterbacks, two dominant defenses. It's everything you could hope for to see in a clash of the SEC Titans. Of course, the biggest question is, will Tua Tonga Viola be anything close to 100%? LSU doesn't play the traditional smash, smash mouth style of SEC football, and if Joe Burrow can turn this game into a track meet, Alabama might be vulnerable. However, the Tides still boast a roster loaded with NFL caliber talent at every position, and they don't necessarily need a big game from Tonga Viola to, win the, to get the win. All right, gentlemen, who do you have for this one? LSU, Alabama, big matchup. Zach, what do you think? I'm going to take Bama at home. I can't go against them and Nick Saban. Nick Saban's won eight straight versus LSU, only lost three total in 13 years against them. And I uh, just think he can get a team ready for a game like this, especially at home. Nick Saban is not going to want to lose this game at home. He's not going to want to lose any game regardless. But Tua's going to come back, even if he doesn't have the mobility that he sometimes has. Bama's only given up nine sacks on the entire season. Uh, and Kyle Trask kind of showed that you can kind of throw on LSU's defense a little bit. He went for 300 plus and three touchdowns. I think Bama's gonna just give everything they got this game, and uh, they're just too good of a team not to show up at home against in the biggest game of the year for them. Yeah, Dylan. Well, I think you're right about you know Alabama has only given up nine sacks, but LSU's <laughs> defensive line is a, is a defensive line they've not faced anything close to so far. Uh, and I'm gonna say two words for you. Uh, Zach, and if you could maybe put some subtitles down there. I'm about to say, go Tigers! Ed Orgeron, he's going to lead the Tigers to a win today. I think LSU comes out on top. I think Joe Burrow leads the way with a lot of uh, big plays, a lot of big yardage, a lot of big touchdowns. And we've seen in the past Alabama struggled with some quarterback play. I had it written down. I'm going to go through these all. Look at this. Deshaun Watson in the national title. This is just in the college football playoff era. Deshaun Watson in the national title game. 420 yards, three touchdowns. Clemson wins that one. Trevor Lawrence, 347 yards, three touchdowns. Clemson wins that one. Chad Kelly, 341 yards, three touchdowns. Ole Miss wins that one. Bo Wallace, 251 yards, three Bo touchdowns. Wallace. We're going Ole back to Miss Bo Wallace that one. for this. So what I'm <laughs> saying to you is four out of, their, uh, out of their six losses in the playoff era have been because of great quarterbacks quarterback play so if Joe Burrow shows up today it's an LSU win all right I like the impersonation that was Thank a good you. touch, good touch. <laughs> all right Matt who do you have for this one Joe Burrow might have a bad game today but I think Tua Tagovailoa will have a worse game the LSU secondary has the talent athleticism to match up with the Alabama receivers force Tua into some bad reads and in terms of offense LSU has a pretty solid ground game with Clyde Edwards Hilaire He'll be matched up against an Alabama run defense that's allowing over four yards per carry in SEC play. I think the Tigers do it. All right. Well, let's uh, go through some upset picks today. Zach, who do you have shocking football fans? Uh, mine's not too popular. I like uh, Iowa State in this game against Oklahoma. I think it's going to be a close game. They're like a 14-point dog, 14-and-a-half-point dog. I think Iowa State has stayed close in every single game they've played so far this season. Lost to Iowa by one. Lost to Baylor by two, have another loss in the season, but it was Oklahoma State, six points, kind of threw a pick six to lose, not too great. But I think this game is going to stay close. Brock Purdy can sling it around over 320 yards per game. 
And Oklahoma doesn't have that great of a defense, if you haven't heard. So I think Iowa State can keep this game close, and it'll be tight heading late into the fourth quarter. Oh, that's a hot take. I'm not too happy with your pick. Sometimes but uh, you got to throw one out there. Yeah, I guess you got to do it. All right, Dylan, who do you have? Well, I'm going to kind of throw one out there, too. I've been off on every single one of my upset picks so far this year. So I'm swinging for the fences, and I'm saying TCU over Baylor. The 4-4 four and four Horned Frogs take it to the undefeated Baylor Bears. Uh, TCU 37th in total offense, 25th in total defense, so they're not a bad team by any any, any means. Obviously picking up uh, a couple of big wins already on the year, and Baylor is maybe not playing their best ball right now, and I hate the term trap game, but I'm about to use it, okay? <laughs> uh. Because here's the thing, if Baylor's looking ahead to Oklahoma, TCU could sneak up and win this game today, so I'm taking the Horn Frogs. Yeah, I like that. I'm gonna, yeah. Mine's a trap game, too. That's why I did it. That's why I did it. <laughs> All right, Matt. I'm taking Duke over Notre Dame. Notre Dame's offense has struggled. They put up just 35 points in their past two games. The Blue Devils have an above-average pass defense. If Ian Book can't get going and continues to struggle like he has recently, Notre Dame's in trouble. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today on Game Day U. Don't forget to come back next week. Have a great game day.